Welcome to the fourth and final session of our Resilience Talks learning series with our host, Milton Friesen. In this dynamic four-part series, Milton will be joined by thought leaders from across the country to explore urban dynamics that contribute to resilience in our cities and communities. Today's session is entitled Resilience and Money, and Milton has invited special guest Brian Dykma to join him to provide insights and often muted perspectives into the social dimensions of payday loans and explore the structural issues that support this system. At the heart of this webinar is understanding the social precarity that drives individuals to become susceptible to payday loans and how building social resilience might address these underlying issues. I'd like to welcome the host of the Resilience Talk series, Milton Friesen, to the session today. Milton is one of our Tamarack thought leaders and is a senior fellow and program director of Social Cities at Cardis, a North American think tank. He has served as an elected municipal official and his current work at the University of Waterloo School of Planning involves a new proposal for measuring social impact. His work on network science applications for planning includes participation in the Waterloo Institute on Complexity and Innovation. His paper, Social Infrastructure, Underpinning the Success of Cities, explores the patterns of relationships we have with each other as individuals and groups and suggests that these will determine the long-term viability of where we live. This paper was recently published in Municipal World. I would also like to welcome our special guest for today's session, Brian Dykma. Brian is Program Director, Work and Economics at CARDIS. This program explores the institutional and policy relationships between government, civil society, and the markets, with a particular view of exploring how a diverse civil society contributes to a vital and thriving market economy and stable government. We are so delighted to welcome you both and appreciate you taking the time to share your insights and experiences with us today. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to you, Milton, to explore the connections between resilience and money. Thank you, Christy, for a great introduction. And I just uh, want to welcome uh, uh, Brian Dykema to, uh, to our program today. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to start, as I usually do, with uh, just a brief kind of recap of what we mean by resilience, just so we're on the same page. And then we're going to take the conversation uh, very quickly uh, in the direction of uh, Brian's work and exploration of uh, the role that money and finances play uh, in our resilience questions uh, in our urban and neighborhood context. Um, usually when we think of resilience, you know, we tend to see it in a positive light. And you can see on the slide um, that the kind of rough and ready, uh, simple um, definition that we use is the, the capacity to adapt well to unexpected changes. And uh, you see the moss piglet there, that little creature that I made, which is uh, the tardigratus, this incredibly tough little uh, thing that's about a millimeter long and you know, can survive radiation and you know, years of drought and being dried up and in other ways uh, you know, subject to all sorts of conditions that would immediately end our life as organisms. Um, but it can survive because it's able to adjust to all these harsh conditions and in that sense is a kind of mascot uh, for resilience, the ability to survive change and, and to do well um, in the face of change. Um, one of the things that we often or can overlook is that the role of change, um, you know, how it impacts the social structures and the fact that social structures are actually critical parts of whether we adapt successfully to change or not. So in this case, the, uh, the little moss piglet um, does well as an individual organism, although it has some community features that help it, but really it sort of survives on its own. The reality is for most of us as people, um, our ability to persist and do well over time is in incredibly dependent on the people around us, the organizations, the structures, the relationships that we experience. And a really important dimension of this um, is the way that resources move among us, and that brings us to money. Uh, Brian has done some excellent work on exploring um, a very common uh, part of any city landscape which is uh, what role do payday loans play uh, in the sort of social ecology of our cities and, and how we function and how we work. And uh, some of the research that, uh, that he's done um, has shed some really interesting light um, on the role that they play uh, in our communities and, and how they impact individuals. So Brian, uh, let's get right into it. And why don't you give us a quick sketch of what exactly are payday loans? Right. Uh, thanks, Milton, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to the Tamarack Institute for, for hosting this. Um, I, uh, a, a payday loan um, is a specific type of loan. It was um, uh, they're short-term loans uh, meant uh, to 
cover uh, unexpected expenses and um, and cash flow shortages. So in 2006, uh, it's one of these um, very um, sort of technical things that happen in our parliament that get very little notice. But in 2006, Canada's usury laws, and uh, I know many people might even be surprised to know that we have usury laws, but they were changed. And they were changed to allow um, certain loans uh, to be exempt from the criminal exemptions uh, or the limits uh, of, of, of loans. And so uh, a payday loan is a loan that is uh, exempt from the 60% annual income or annual interest rate. Uh, that is, uh, is a crime if you do that. And it's uh, less than 62 days. So short term uh, and uh, exempt from uh, usury laws. Uh, by the so, federal government. so Brian, if I can interrupt there. So this, that yeah. means that in 2006, uh, prior to 2006, it was illegal to charge more than 60% uh, as far as an annual interest rate. So, so your credit card company couldn't suddenly jack the, the, the interest rates up to 70% per annum or anything like that. It was actually, that was actually illegal prior to 2006. Is that correct? Correct. And it's still illegal. Uh, your credit card still can't do that. Um, but okay. a payday lender can. So it's okay. lo the, the, the technical definition is loans of $1,500 or less that have a term of 62 days uh, or less. I see. Um, and so those are those were uh, exempt, and so it wasn't as if a wild west. It was said the the federal government simply downloaded responsibility for managing those loans to the provinces, which is why we have our uh, sort of hodgepodge of various interest rates and regulations that happen today. Okay, there's a long there's a longer history which is fascinating, but we should talk about. But that's that's a quick look. Okay, great. I think, and most of us have probably seen the various, uh, you know, outlets that, that offer these loans. We see them on TV, radio ads. We, we see them as we walk the streets. People that offer kind of the, the magical solution of, you know, you walk in needing money and 20 minutes later you walk out and you've, you've got cash in your pocket and it's just that easy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, so who uses payday loans? I think that's, that's an interesting, you know, we all have a sense of who might use those loans, but uh, that's a telling part that will get us into some of the uh, the social resilience questions around it. Yeah, that, this is actually this is actually a topic that surprises most people. Um, when you when you think of payday loans, you think of uh, desperate people, uh, and often that's true. They are desperate desperately in need of credit, um, but it's not it's not the the person that you might think. It's not necessarily the poorest of the poor. Uh, in fact. Some people who would fit into that category aren't even allowed to take them. Um, and you can see some of the data there that, that we have. Um, there's about 50%, uh, just, a, just a little bit less than 50% are making less than $35,000 a year. So the, the good chunk of payday loan users are working poor people. Um, and that's another thing. You actually have to be working. You have to be employed to get a payday loan. Um, but what's what's most surprising to some people is that 25% of users are actually making over $50,000 a year. So there's about 16% who earn between 50,000 and 75,000. So the median uh, income, if I'm not mistaken, these days is 53. So a good 16% of, of payday loan users are actually at or above uh, the median uh, uh, income uh, level, and 9% had income over $75,000. So it's surprising for a lot of people to hear that, holy smokes, there are actually people who make a good living, who are employed, earning very strong or, uh, wage, uh, wage levels, and who still go to use them. Um, so that's, 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 that's often surprises a lot of people. So why do they use them? What's, what's the nature of, of the, the payday loan user? So um, you know, if you're challenging our, our conception, perhaps, that uh, payday loans are sort of the, the, the last resort for people who have no other means of getting money, which you're saying is not the case. Um, so why do they use payday loans? I mean, we have all sorts of banking institutions, you know, looking for our, uh, our service all the time, our business. Why, why payday loans? Well, there, there are. <laughs> that's actually an extremely uh, complicated uh, answer. But the short, the short answer to that is that um, uh, that they're fast and easy, um, and that is a that is a leading uh, reason why people use them. Um, Milton, you sort of alluded to the fact that you can walk in and half an hour uh, later come out with cash in your pocket, and that's actually true. Um, most uh, payday loan stores can get you a loan. Uh, in, in about 35 minutes if it's the first loan and if it's the second or third or fourth or fifth and we can talk about that too um, it's less often less than 20 minutes so it's very fast very convenient 
Um, another thing, another sort of human factor about why people use them is that um, uh, they are, there is a friendly perception. People don't feel judged going in. Money is one of those things that very few people um, don't like talking about. It's uncomfortable. I, I sort of joke on my Twitter handle that I talk about uh, money and religion and things like that, and therefore I don't get invited to parties. But uh, right. Um, <laughs> but the but it is true that that people go to these places because they like um, the friendly atmosphere and the lack of judgment. There are other technical reasons. So um, the the sort of the, the most basic one is that they don't have any money and they need money badly. That's why they go. Um, and you can see there, uh, I don't have a moss piglet, but I do have a piggy bank. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the leading drivers is the fact that you don't have any savings. And so payday loans are a substitute for um, savings primarily. And, um, even, and even if you don't have savings, they're a substitute for other forms of credit. Um, and that's, I think, an important thing to know. And one of the things we mentioned in our papers, is there's actually a spectrum uh, of types of credit that people have access to. Um, and they they go on a sort of um, on a on a good uh, to a very bad very bad being loan sharks or illegal uh, loans so the bank held held angels or something like that um, where there are you know uh, high risks associated with that high costs to the best kind of loan which is the bank of mom and dad uh, or or a natural community we call it so. The cost of, a, of, of borrowing 200 bucks, and this is these often payday loans are very small. As I said, um, legally they're required to be less than 1,500 uh, dollars, but often they run around about 300 to 400 uh, dollars on average. They're small, and um, the best way to get through 400 dollars is to give mom and dad a call, or to give a family a call, or to give your church a call. And there's lots of examples of. of natural communities that offer this. Um, some ethnic communities uh, do this. Um, a lot of families do that. And those are, those are very cheap. They're very easy to get. And your collateral is basically your relationship. Uh, and that's an important one. But then there's other forms of credit, lines of credit, credit cards, cash advantages, and so on, that sort of work their way all the way down to the loan shark. So that's, that's a bit of a picture of what they're substituting for. So uh, you've got a on your graphic here. You've got the idea that uh, you know credit cards are not an option so open to people because what you've just described, needing some money, not having it saved up, uh, you know, seems to be the terrain for most people. Of that's a credit card, a credit limit of some kind that you have room on your card to you know a car breaks down or there's some emergency bridge financing is needed and you use your credit card for that or an impulse spend. Um, so let's talk about that because I think we're going to get to some of the implications of this in a minute, but I, I think it's important we spend a bit of time on the descriptive side of exactly what these are and what's happening around the payday loan space, and then we'll talk a bit about some of the, the resilience issues related to it. So, sure. so describe to us the credit card relationship, what's going on there or what's not going on there, and, and how do uh, payday loans fit in that matrix? Right. So, I mean, you can see the little graphic there that if you don't, if you've been refused a credit card, you're, you're, you're a bit better than three and a half times more likely to use uh, a payday loan. And that, that sort of speaks to the fact that payday loans are a, a credit source of last resort. Um, what it, what's more complicated, though, if you dig down deep, deeper into the data and you look at why, um, there are some people who, who are approved for credit cards and actually have limits, uh, uh, or sorry, space, to, to borrow on their credit card, which is a lower rate, um, and still choose to do payday loans. And that's an interesting question. You say, why, why would you use a payday loan if you have your MasterCard, which is going to be 18% per annum, um, which you know, is expensive, but it's nowhere near the you know, 766% that Ontario has. Um, and, and that's where you get into some of the real sort of human behavioral sides of the way we deal with money. And one of the reasons is that people don't trust themselves with the credit card. They feel that if they use that credit card, they're going to get stuck and they're going to start just um, uh, almost like somebody who doesn't want to be around uh, other smokers if they've quit, right? So there are, there are um, different reasons why people do that. Um, uh, even if they have access to other so other forms of credit, some of it is uh, is what behavioral economists will call uh, sort of a naive uh, sense of um, uh, or sort of a, a bounded rationality. They're not quite clear on what what's to do, or they think this is going to be the best thing for me, even though other other options may be better for them. What uh, can you give us a? Uh, let's go back to the idea of who uses these loans because there's you, you've uncovered some interesting things there too. So you've already said it's not necessarily the poorest of the poor. It's not people that aren't working. 
Yep. Um, so give us some scenarios of the, of the kinds of people who, who would walk into a payday loan um, outlet and, uh, you know, and look for that $300 cash back or whatever, you know, whatever it is that they want. So. Yeah, right. I, I think the best way to, to think about it is, is actually to use um, uh, a figure that we're calling Alice. Uh, and Alice is your typical payday loan user. And you know, we sort of uh, chuckled when Reese and I were doing the paper. We said we, you know, we we said we need to find somebody who can exemplify what what the typical user is. And then we looked in the um, uh, the financial statements of some of the major corporations that were doing this, and we actually said, well, they actually have the picture of that person. Her name is Alice, and Alice uh, is actually an acronym, and it stands for somebody who is asset limited. So uh, they don't have assets, they don't have a house or anything like that, which is typically used for um, securing a line of credit, which is one of the one of the cheapest forms of uh, of credit. So asset limited, income constrained. So that means they have limited income, and it may that may be that is uh, limited according to their expenses, of course. So that's why you see some people who have uh, very high income still using them. So asset limited, income constrained, and employed. So this person must be employed. So what happens when you walk into a payday loan store is you apply for your loan. Um, and you have to show, uh, in order to, to get that loan, you have to show a few things. One is uh, uh, ID. You have to show your, either your passport or your driver's license, your health card or what have you. Um, and you have to show proof of employment, and that's typically done with a pay stub. Um, and then you have to have a post-dated check or form a, an authorized withdrawal. And that's it. That's all you need to do uh, to go in and use them. Um, so some scenarios are, um, and, and these are some of the drivers of, of why people use them, what, what the payday loans are being used for. I think we might have a slide on, on that one as well. Um, but a lot of people think, when they first think, they think, oh, these are folks who just aren't um, doing a very good job managing their money. That's not actually true. Some of the data shows that um, uh, uh, those people who are in very sort of income constrained situations actually manage their money quite well. Um, but it's often things that are unexpected. So 34% uh, uh, of people say they use payday loans because of an unexpected expense. And that's a classic case of, say you're a PSW, a personal support worker who's earning 20 bucks an hour or slightly less, and you need your car to transport your children and to get to work, and your brakes go. And it's a $400 job. Um, because of rent and other costs, you, you're short that money. Uh, the payday loan is, is the only place that's going to be able to give you that 400 bucks, and you need to do that or you're going to lose the job. So that's a sort of an unexpected um, expense. Um, sometimes it's, it's for a temporary reduction in income. So if you're that same PSW uh, and your hours get cut that week um, or you're sick or you have to take care of your child, for instance, for a couple of days, um, you, you, just, you just don't have that income for that week, so you need to get over it. Others are for avoiding late charges or avoiding bouncing checks. And there is a small portion as well, um, about 13%, and it depends on whose number you're using, but anywhere from 7 to 13% who are using it for discretionary purposes. So that's surprising for some people too, that the number of people who are using it to buy, you know, to get, to get money for the bar for the weekend or something like that is actually quite low. That's it, and that, I, that's what I found almost most interesting was, um, looks like we don't have the slide, but I'm just going to recap kind of the relative percentages of those reasons why people use payday loans, that the top 55% is for necessities. So these are people that need food or they need to make rent or something like that. 34% um, are unexpected expenses like the brakes on your vehicle or maybe something's come up where you've lost, you know, some, some your rent, you know, needs to be delivered or extra food or something's come up or your kids need some sort of things for school. Who knows? Just unexpected expenses. Mm -hmm. And then we go down to avoiding late charges on routine bills. So somebody needs to, you know, cover their hydro or something like that. That's 22%. Then we drop, you know, down to kind of um, into, into the smaller figures once we get below that. Um, but the idea that someone's going to walk into a payday loan place because they want to buy a flat screen TV is actually quite rare in, in terms of the statistics that you're offering. Yeah, that's right. That, that, would, be, that would be somebody on the margins. And, and I, I think it's important to note, I mean, one of the things I said earlier, it's, it tends to be younger, uh, younger folks who use these. Uh, and there, there's a variety of reasons for that. If, you, if, you know, if this is taking the place of other forms of credit and other forms of credit are typically backed by assets. Younger folks often don't have the same type of assets that more mature or, or, or older people who've earned for longer have. Um, and there is a, some there is some indication that that 13% is used by by young men, and that's the sort of uh, you know needing money to go for the bar. But it's 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 actually very very small, um, and I think that's an important thing to note as you're saying well. 
this is not a, um, there are cases where it's, it's because of bad budgeting and so on, but research suggests that those who are on that, those constrained incomes actually manage their money quite well. Um, so there are, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, examples where people don't and so on, but, but there is enough uh, evidence to, to suggest that uh, um, the likelihood of people buying the big screen TVs or whatever is, is not, it's not one of the major drivers. So when we look, so we take a look at that landscape and 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 think about these kinds of you know necessities, um, unexpected bills that need to be taken care of, uh, it gives you us a sense of the scenario that happens when people get in trouble uh, through using payday loans. So what happens when things go badly? You go in for your first loan, um, you know you need it just as a bit of bridge financing because you know life has expect unexpected curves and turns that it gives to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but give us a scenario of how you know of, of how that can actually start kind of winding down in the wrong direction. Right. I, I would say this is a this is a very common scenario, and 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 one of the things we point in our paper is that it's common because it's inherent to the structure of the, of this entire industry. And so, what happens when you take the payday loan? We can go back to that. Is you have to of course give your ID and so on. But once you get the loan, and it's for say a ten day term, it means you have to pay back your loan after 10 or within 10 days. The way in which these loans are structured is that you have to pay back, they're, they're called balloon payments. And this is why you have to give a post-dated check um, or authorize a withdrawal. What you're doing is you're giving a post-dated check for the cost of the loan, so the principal, plus the interest all at once. And so it's $21 per 100, and it depends on how, uh, or it's that's, uh, that's a fixed fee. So if you're going to borrow it for, um, uh, for two days or two uh, two weeks, for instance, you're going to have forty-two dollars. So you're going to have to pay one hundred and forty-two dollars back. So if you needed that one hundred dollars, if your cash flow was already that constrained, um, you are you are going to have to pay that plus the interest all at once, the balloon payment, and that's the real challenge. What what often happens is, for people who are income constrained and whose cash flow in particular is constrained, um, taking these loans puts you in danger of needing it again. Um, and if you look at some of the offers, for instance, uh, the way that um, the businesses are structured, we did some work at looking at the cost of provision for first-time loans. Um, mm -hmm. There were some studies, in the, and we looked at that. The most payday lenders will take a hit on the first loan, and you can often see that. You can say introductory rate. Look for the signs. I, I encourage everybody who's listening to, uh, when they're going down the, uh, the down the street, look for the signs that says, you know, $300 loan for two two dollars or what have you. These are some of the introductory rates, and most of the companies, even if they're charging the normal rates, will be taking um, a loss. Um, and the reason they're willing to take that loss is because they know that they will likely be getting a repeat customer. Um, and so uh, uh, what, what happens because of the payday loan, the balloon structure and so on, is they're counting on that customer to come back again and again and again. Um, and that happens quite regularly. So they, in that sense, over time, they make their money on this person getting increasingly indebted, um, facing that 766% per annum rate, exactly. and, and that that's where they're going to make their money back. Now, you, you also uncovered something interesting, which is that the industry itself, and this is going to move us now a little bit more towards some of these social uh, resilience questions, because you discovered that the, the industry itself, the, the profit margins aren't, aren't as large as we might think, that um, you know a payday loan outlet is not necessarily... Uh, you know, kind of a license to print money. There's actually some constraints that are involved there as well. That, yeah, that's absolutely right. So that's another another common myth that that people think, wow, these interest rates are 700 percent, etc. They must be raking the money in. Um, uh, that's not actually true. So one of one of our we looked again at the the profit margins um, and uh, of the various companies using um, uh, publicly available. Uh, data uh, from when these companies were publicly traded. It's a little bit old now. It's from 2013, so we don't know how they've done in the last three years. But um, there hasn't been any major structural change, so we can assume that it's it's fairly similar. Um, but uh, their average profit margin was only about eight and a half percent of sales before taxes for one of the biggest companies, which was Money Mart. So eight and a half percent is pretty good. Um, you know, you can't you can't complain about making a profit like that. It's fairly solid, but it's not the huge it's not the huge um, uh, profit margins that you would think. And some of the reasons for that, again, um, are because of all those stores that you see. So, 
another myth, if, if I can sort of say, is that, you know, well, one of the reasons why these costs are so high is because they have so many bad customers who don't pay back. And that is true. There are, they have significantly higher um, bad debt levels than mortgage companies or other lenders. Um, but it really only accounts for about $4 of every $100 loan. So that's about 20% 20, uh, 20 sorry, of the cost of providing the loan is bad debt. The bulk of the cost, 75% of the cost, it comes for uh, operating costs. So that's the, the buildings that you see, the signage, all of the advertising. You see quite a bit of billboards and things like that, um, and the salaries, et cetera. That accounts for 75% of the cost of the loan, and that's a huge that's a huge amount, uh, and that's why the, some of their, their margins are not as high as you might think. So Brian, if these are places where people start um, at a state of need and uh, you know that, that the people that run them are counting on the fact that they're going to come back and actually get in some financial trouble, um, not enough so they lose their jobs, but enough so that they continue to kind of increase the amount that they're borrowing and, and the amount of interest paying back, why don't we just get rid of payday loans? Like, Talk, walk through us the scenario that happens if we decide tomorrow that these are parasitic, these aren't good. I know cities, for instance, from a planning standpoint in different places are street kind of cleanup maneuver or, uh, you know, um, uh, emphases that say, well, if we just got rid of places like this, you know, they're a sign, they're, they're a sign of, of some dysfunction. Let's just get rid of them and the problem will solve itself. Why is that or is that a sufficient response to uh, the payday loan industry? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question, and, and I actually think it points a little bit towards, um, it sort of gets at the, the question of resilience. In some ways, um, look, I have a number of reasons for, for believing these things are actually quite bad and actually do have a negative effect on communities, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the question always is, they have a negative effect compared to what? Um, and, and one of the things um, about markets is that, um, they often find there are little niches that, that come in to fill in certain needs, uh, and payday loans is one of them. It's actually payday loans, the existence of them are an example of sort of the resilience of credit markets, and it's the ability to adapt. Uh, you, you talk about it, the capacity to adapt well to unexpected changes. I would say I put a lot of less emphasis on the ability to, to adapt well. I actually think we're not adapting as well as we could, um, but it is an adaptation which uh, allows people to adapt to their to their um, sorry it's a it's a product that enables people to adapt to their situation and an example is this if you're in the city of Toronto uh, and you're in danger uh, your hydro is in danger you're behind on your bills your hydro is in danger of being cut um, you do the math and you say well if my hydro gets cut um, I'm going to have to pay a ninety dollar um, uh, reinstatement fee or a reconnecting fee. Um, well, my loan of a couple hundred bucks may only cost me $42, and you say, well, in that sense, it's a rational economic decision to take that payday loan, even though it may mean over the long term you're paying back more. You say, well, I'm not actually willing to take that hit. Or you do the math on, for instance, on, on a bounce check. Um, uh, some companies will, uh, will charge you um, uh, bounce check charges or NSF charges, and your bank will do that too, and you say, well, if I'm going to have to pay $90, it makes sense for me to, to spend the $42 of interest uh, at this point. So that's, that's what happens. People are in desperate need of cash, and they choose these things as a sort of rational choice on the margins. And so what, what we've said is payday loans are an awful choice, um, but they're better than the alternative sometimes, which is, which is an even more awful choice. Um, and, and that's really the question. So if that credit need exists, if we... Um, if we cannot fix that need for credit overnight, and I don't think we can, um, this is an issue that's been around. I mean, we do a bit of a history. It's been around for quite quite some time. And the fact that you know ancient uh, Jewish and Christian and, and Islamic scriptures talk about usury and so on, so it's not it's not exactly a problem we're going to get rid of. Um, the question is, what happens if these loans are not here and the need remains? The need for credit remains. There's there's significant evidence that suggests that. Um, uh, bad things can happen, and sometimes th that bad thing means people are going to be spending more for reconnection fees, etc., as well as other challenges, including, um, for instance, the increase uh, of black market lending and so on. So it's not as simple as saying they're bad, we should get rid of them, and, uh, and nor is it as simple as some of the other folks on the other side of the argument who say, look, this is just a normal market response, and we should be happy that the market is so resilient. We, we actually say, 
look, it's not enough to ask the question whether they're, they're socially useful or have social harm. I think the evidence is clear that they are socially useful and that there's significant social harm. So the question is, what are we going to do then? Uh, and we, we say what we need to do is actually work towards building a better market. What, do, um, what other things are they symptomatic of? So if we say that they're there to fill a niche, even if we take the market argument and say that you know, it's simply the market responding to a need that's there, um, you know, what's going on kind of underneath? If, if we assume that payday loans, um, and maybe you don't make this assumption, but I will in my question, and you can challenge sure. it if you need to. <laughs> sure. um, you know, that if, if we take uh, payday loans as symptomatic of what's going on in the social landscape, is it a sign of increased resilience, decreased resilience? Like what's going on? underneath and behind uh, the payday loan industry um, that might not be as obvious looking at a storefront ad? Yeah, I think, I think that's actually a key point. I think there are, there are deeper um, cultural uh, issues, and I think there are also uh, deeper uh, neighborhood and community issues. I think if you think back to earlier in the conversation where we talked about the spectrum of, of various types of loans, um, the lowest cost loans, particularly for small dollars, we're talking about. And again, the average loans are, are anywhere between three and four hundred dollars. They're not they're not huge amounts of loans or huge amount of dollars. Sorry, um, but the fact that people are having to turn here rather than to local communities, local natural communities, is indicative of the fact that that those communities aren't there, um, or that those communities don't have the ability to organize to sort of put these things together. So I think that that's one thing that uh, that we need to know. Um, another thing is to sort of read this against the background of how we understand debt uh, in, in our day and age today. Uh, um, and we've, we've done some work on this, and, and there's also a number of studies uh, done by sort of uh, bipartisan groups in the United States that say, look, what, what it actually happens is we have, um, for a variety of cultural reasons, um, lifted a sort of social taboo, something that was not uh, was never like it was illegal because we had usury laws and so on, but it was always sort of taboo to spend beyond your means, right? It's the the classic case or the classic story. I always say is uh, a friend of mine who who bought a pair of very expensive Air Jordan sneakers, uh, basketball shoes in in high school because uh, he wanted he wanted to you know he wanted to play like Michael Jordan. When his dad found out how much they cost, he made him take them right back. That's that's a sort of internal constraint or check on debt. And I think that as a culture, um, we have we have sort of lifted those social constraints. They're no longer there to the extent that they were. And I think there's benefits to that, and so on uh, sometimes. But but I think there's that's an underlying uh, an underlying factor there as well. So those are just a couple of the uh, sort of um, I think deeper questions that are at play. So with removing payday loans for individuals, for some individuals, those who use it, um, if that source of credit was not available to them. They would actually be less resilient to the bumps and and turns and unexpected sort of uh, emergencies that come up. Is that is, is that is that possible to make that assertion um, that that having you, yeah yeah I think you could say that with a fairly high degree of confidence for a segment of the users. Um, and so I mean this is the classic researcher talking, right? I'm uh, I'm hedging <laughs> hedging four or five times, but I think you can say um, that if we were to just get rid of them cold turkey. Or if we were to put in a regulatory framework which, which were to prevent um, uh, these types of uh, uh, forms of credit from being available, that it would have a negative effect on some. It would, the flip side, of course, is that it would have a benefit uh, to some who would no longer have access to, to credit that they really shouldn't access, right? So, but I would say on, on, on average, if you're looking at the cost to get strictly rid of, or rid of this form of credit without an alternative in place, would would be uh, would be negative. It would be it would be a bad thing. It would make people less resilient, and I think it would actually have um, uh, effects on communities as well. Yeah, a kind of negative cascading effect that that bridge fund funding that they needed, um, yeah. it not being there, would would push them towards your hydro's disconnected. Now you can't access the internet, or now you can't, you know, yeah. your car breaks down, you can't get to work, you lose your yeah. job, or you lose a shift, or whatever. And it sort of has people's fear of that. The cascading slide, you know, that they run on that precarious edge, and if you're a single mom trying to raise her kids on her own and yeah. lacking adequate support, um, you know, that bridge financing might actually be something that's that helps you smooth out the bumps. That, of course, businesses do this all the time, right? It's accepted. You have bridge financing yeah. for a reason. Unexpected yeah. things come up, and you need some, you know, you need some cash, you need some capital right away, and so it's it's there for you if you need it. And and yeah. lines of credit are there for that reason as well. Um, if you looked at an institutional I, response. I, I, 
Can I have one thing, Milton, to that? And that's that one thing I, I, I want to be clear about, though, is that while I, while I, I, would, I would say that it's better than having nothing, um, what we say in our paper and what, I, what I, I think is true and I think the evidence backs this up is that saying something is better than having nothing is the, the equivalent of damning it with faint praise. Right. Um, and, I, right. and I think there are, um, I think there are other negative community um, uh, or ne effects that come as a result of payday loans as well. So the absence, so payday loans may prevent the worst things from having are happening, but their existence in the absence of better and more enabling forms of credit still have a cascading effect. We call it the ripple effect of, of debt. Um, and there is a ripple effect. The, there's a fairly um, high degree of, of consensus. And, and of course, the causal relationships are, are tricky. But there's high correlations between the use of these things and the presence of these these type of lenders with uh, property crime, with increased healthcare costs, with increased policing costs, um, you know, uh, um, increased um, uh, socialized. It basically, what it does is it socialize some of those costs. So, you know, it may. It's one thing to say it's better than having nothing. It's another thing to say we should just leave it as it is. And and, and I think that if you really want to look at how these things interact with community. Um, you have to look at that side as well. We're gonna, I'm open to questions, so if you have a question, please just type it in. Um, I'll, lo I'll look at them kind of as, as they're coming in, um, if, if there are questions, and, and uh, introduce them and, uh, as it fits the discussion. I have, I'll, otherwise, I'll continue kind of working through a few more questions with Brian. Um, one of the, the questions I think that would be of interest, many of our listeners, as I noted at the beginning of the, uh, of the discussion, you know, are working at community level. They're trying to improve their communities, uh, whether it's through government agencies, um, whether it's through community organizations. Um, you know, working to better their cities, their communities of all sizes. And if you looked at, you know, the conditions that may give rise to payday loans being the, you know, the absence of having natural community and, and bridging kind of spaces like that to kind of help things out, what are, what are some institutional, organizational, or community level responses that could get at, um, you know, cutting off the need uh, for these kinds of payday loans in the first place? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. And to, to get at that, you have to, I mean, some of it would be as simple as um, having somebody earn more money, right? I mean, that's one, uh, there's certainly been those who are saying, look, to get rid of these, we need to ensure that people have more cash. Um, I think there is something to that. I think that would address some of the challenges for some uh, some of the users, but it's certainly not uh, not a key problem. I think, um, I think, uh, Financial literacy is a huge thing, and I, I think one of the, as I said earlier, one of the major drivers um, is savings. Um, and and the sort of the stats on that, I think it's right up on the screen, is that if you have less than five hundred dollars in the bank, you're you're more than twice, almost you know over over two and a half times more likely to to take a payday loan, which which indicates that if you have a little bit of say, even a little bit of savings, five hundred dollars put away. That you would you would reduce the sort of the rainy day type fund, you would reduce the need uh, for that, and that that five hundred dollars is not actually that much, um, but we we don't have a lot of um, uh, we haven't done a lot of talking about how to ensure that people do that, um, and there's all kinds of great papers. There's there's a really interesting paper um, out there that talks about using um, certain behavioral techniques to get people excited to to actually save and to show some of the um, the examples of that. And, and some examples that we're looking at um, are trying to replicate some of the models that have been used overseas with little savings groups, for instance. Um, uh, Kiva and a number of other groups will do this, the community savings pools or community savings uh, um, uh, type of uh, programs where you rely on a group of friends who each put in X number of dollars. The, these are some examples of, of community groups that can start these very small uh, programs to address that savings issue, which is one of the key sort of um, uh, dams to prevent people from from having to go to a payday loan store. Very good. I'm going to go. We've got a question, so I'm going to turn it. Christy's going to, um, I think, put uh, put uh, one of the guests or one of our listeners through, uh, who's got a question for you, Brian. Great. Thanks, Milton and Brian. Hi. I have Danielle Kluster on the line. Danielle, are you there? I am. Wonderful. Can you hear me? We sure can. Hi, Danielle. Hi. Uh, so I was, um, because in Alberta, you probably know that new legislation has just gone through, and um, so there's some significant restriction now on um, the practices that payday lenders can 
can uh, utilize in their businesses. And so we've had a, a lot of uh, media exposure around this and um, uh, I've been on radio and television debating with a payday lender a couple of times now in the last couple of weeks. And he, he told me and the television audience last week that um, in their, in their um, target market, which he wouldn't use the term target market, but in, in their user group, 87% um, of the people who use payday loans have a credit score of under 600. And so the reason that they're using payday loans is because they genuinely can't get credit anywhere else. And and another piece of that contributes to this conversation is in my research, I learned that the number one risk group for falling into poverty and falling into a, um, a really unhealthy debt cycle are women leaving a domestic relationship um, because they have often no credit um, and uh, often income instability. Yep. And, and, and then when they do have to go out and and I was interested in what you said about, um, you know, getting people excited, excited about savings and whatnot. Well, if if folks are making twelve dollars an hour and the living wage in their community is eighteen, you know, they're never going to be able to get excited about savings because they don't have the their income doesn't meet their basic needs. So I wondered if, you know, given all those factors, if you like could agree, and I think you, I, I think you might have sort of um, said this in a roundabout way. Would you agree that payday loans contribute to a climate that puts people at risk of falling into poverty if they haven't arrived there yet? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a great question. I think you, you highlight a couple of very important points. One is that, yes, absolutely, one of the, one of the main drivers for, for the use is that people can't get, get credit elsewhere. So payday loans are a sort of credit source of last resort. So that's absolutely, absolutely agree with you on that. I also think your, your insight into um, one of the major risk groups being women uh, leaving relationships. I think that's absolutely true. One of one of the um, one of we had an advisory uh, group uh, from the financial industry and debt counseling and so on that advised us on this paper. One of one of those advisors was um, from an organization called CAP, which is a group called Christians Against Poverty that do debt counseling and so on. And one of their um, a lot of their female clients. Uh, are forced to use payday loans for exactly the reason that you describe. It's um, a new divorce or what have you, and they don't have the same credit score because it was mainly held by their husband or what have you. So that is absolutely a huge risk. So the short answer is yes, payday loans can be a, um, a, uh, a driver uh, of poverty. And we, we've said this um, we've said this in a couple of spots. In some ways, they can be used to present, prevent people from falling in, into poverty if, if they're used well and so on. But often, what they, what they end up being, because of the structure of the loan, is they end up being a ball and chain uh, that, that just drags people further and further down. And this is, this is what we've, we've, we've tried to make the argument for, that the user of a payday loan, uh, bulk of them, are, are, are standing on a threshold. They can either be uh, moving up the economic ladder or sort of settling in their relatively secure place. Um, but once you get into that cycle, and it is, it does absolutely, I mean, you even look at the, the basic math of somebody who's cash flow crunched or has a cash, uh, a cash flow challenge, um, that extra, um, say, $42 on 100 is extremely difficult to get out of. And once you're in, um, it's, it's tough to get out of. So absolutely, I would agree that they can contribute um, as well as prevent, but they certainly can contribute to um, an increase in, uh, in poverty. And I, and I also think when you, you mention um, the fact that incomes are, are too low to get, a, I absolutely think that's an issue too. Um, you know, if somebody's making uh, $12 an hour and they have to feed, or even $15 or $20 an hour and they have to feed three children plus pay rent or so on, that person is very, very constrained in what they can and cannot do and they are on a knife's edge. Uh, their ability to be resilient is certainly hampered by the fact that they don't have that cushion. I, I, I routinely point out that it's very easy for rich people to make mistakes. Um, it's very, very hard for, for people who are poor or who are on uh, a lower income. Mistakes are much more costly in proportion to their, to their income than, than if, you're, if you're wealthy. Um, so I, I think I would say yes to, to your question. I think that's a great question. Thank you for that. I've got another one. I'm going to read it uh, for us, uh, Brian. That's from Patrick Firth. 
And uh, he asks, uh, are there examples of working poor neighborhoods where if it wasn't for the resilience of the place itself, and I'm thinking of placemaking efforts rather than individual level interactions, where you have seen either a reduction of the need for payday loan businesses or the maintenance of a low number of them, or maybe a neighborhood that is characterized by a diverse socioeconomic scale. So are there actually places where, you know, in a, in a succinct way, payday loans, because of the resilience of the community and its resources, have actually decreased the demand for them? Um, I, I, I can't speak to particular geographic neighborhoods. I, I'd love to. I actually don't have that data. I would love to, to know that data. Um, I can speak to certain types of communities, though, uh, uh, and this is, so for instance, in our paper we note um, certain ethnic communities. The Jewish community in Montreal, for instance, has uh, funds available to people in their community who are, if they're in, in trouble or in need, can access those funds uh, um, simply uh, by requesting them. Other, other places, religious communities, so churches, um, uh, Often people who are in who are members of these types of communities can go and say, "Look, we we need a loan, or we need some sort of benevolence, and that will help." Out. There are types of communities that are better at that, and they tend to be communities that are fairly um, sort of have high levels of social solidarity. Whether or not you can you can locate locate that geographically and point to an example where here's one example. I don't I don't have that data. I wish I did, um, but certainly you can you can point to the fact that. Communities that have high degrees of social solidarity and money um, are actually better at serving the needs of payday lenders with, with much lower costs. And that's actually one of the, uh, it's, a, it's a great question because it sort of acts as a bridge. One of the, um, one of the solutions, uh, and we try to fight against solutionism because we don't actually think we're going to fix it, but if we're going to uh, marginally improve and try to, to make a better and better uh, market all the time, is to actually leverage or capture some of the social value of these communities. And it doesn't have to be religious communities alone. It can be uh, groups like the YMCA or other community groups, United Way, et cetera, um, that, that band together. Um, and an interesting example historically is that the, the first credit union, Desjardins, um, was formed in Ottawa for precisely that reason. There were, there were mid-level, sort of low-level uh, white-collar workers who, who needed access to credit, and they were, they were being um, forced to use loan sharks. And so Desjardins and company and a group of, of course, cooperative, uh, launched a cooperative venture. And so that's where we think the, if you're going to, if you're going to build alternatives, that's certainly uh, an important area to look. Great. I'm not Thank sure you. if that directly answers, but yeah. it gets out of the bit. I've got another question here we're going to move to, and then we're going to be getting close to the end of our time. Uh, this is from Glenna Harris, and she asks, what are some of the solutions or alternatives that are emerging right now? You suggested an early example from Ottawa, but anything else you're seeing in the landscape that uh, as people are, many of the listeners are actively working themselves at community levels on different mm -hmm. challenges and, and questions and issues are very informed about what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, are there other hopeful indications of, of ways that people are meeting the demand that, that we might have for these kinds of services in other than payday loan uh, ways. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great question. I, I think one, there's a couple of them. Um, w there are effectively two, uh, we've sort of outlined two ways to shift the economics of the market to, to try to sustain um, what we call market-based but community-focused uh, um, alternatives to payday loans. And one of them is just to look at the cost of providing that loan. And you look at, say, 75% of the cost is the bricks and mortar and salaries and so on. One of the ways that, that um, people are trying to reduce the cost of provision is actually to provide loans without that bricks and mortar. And so you've seen sort of a rise of some financial technological companies. So uh, an example we use is Mogo, uh, which you, if you ever visit the National Post website or any sort of the post media websites that you'll see their type of stuff. And they're using f um, technology to, um, to lower the cost of provision. So lowering that 75% cost uh, to, to offer some payday loans. So that's one. Um, and a lot of people put a, a whole bunch of faith in technology, um, and I have, um, I would say, some faith in technology to address the problem. But I think if you're really looking at um, what it, these things, why people use them, I think you actually do need to get at, um, again, a more cooperative approach and leveraging civil society. Um, and that's why I think if, if we're really um, if we really want to make a difference, you have to look to organizations like credit unions, which are, tend to be a bit more uh, community-focused and cooperative type of banks um, that can offer that. And that's where that's where some of the real alternatives are are coming up. Uh, Van City's got one. 
Uh, Windsor uh, Credit Union in Ontario has one. Uh, First Ontario in, here in Hamilton is looking at. But again, these are all very small scale. I think if you're going to, if you really want a big, um, uh, a big sort of change, you need to get some of the bigger, bigger banks on. But but I think at the margins, what's happening is that. Um, uh, churches, community organizations, and so on are actually banding together and partnering uh, to, to leverage some of their uh, their assets towards that. Two, two brief questions for me, Brian, and then we're going to have to uh, turn things back over to Christy, and, uh, and we're reaching near the end. But uh, two things. One is, what's the size of the industry? So let's give us a quick, just very briefly, what's the size of that industry? Yep. Uh, because I think that's important in terms of context when you talk about sort of smaller efforts coming out of the ground. But, you know, there's, there's already an, a large enough established uh, uh, industry that's there. And the last thing then is, what have the responses been to your work so far? So when you look at this relationship between, you know, helping people in a time of trouble so that they can improve their resilience and response to change, um, you know, what's been the reaction to your work? Right. So the, the first one is it's about a two and a half billion dollar industry in Canada. Um, so it provides about two bill, two and a half billion dollars in volume of loans. Uh, and that's, uh, that those loans are given to uh, an estimated 1.8 to 2.5 million borrowers a year. So quite a few people, not not huge, it's certainly not a huge, like two and a half billion is, is a lot of money, uh, it's not too much, um, but it's, it is it is a lot. A lot of people use it 1.8 to 2.5 million borrowers. So that's a, just a bit of a look at the, the industry itself. Um, and the response to our, um, our paper has actually been pretty good um, in our work. I think one of, the, one of the lines, we've tried to avoid the um, sort of simple solutionism that often comes up in these types of discussions. We said, look, the market has not worked left to its own devices. I think everyone recognizes that. Um, and I think the, there's also a, a fairly substantial recognition that it's not, the state itself can't fix it either. We do a little bit of work on sort of the, you know, the state can set the rules, but at the end of the day, um, the state's not going to provide credit. Um, it's not in the business of that. They don't have the expertise for that. Um, there are some people who suggest it, but I don't think anybody is, is serious about seeing uh, Bank of Alberta open up little payday lenders here and there. I think what what is required is actually for the government to set a solid set of rules. And we've done some work in Ontario, and we'll also be um, doing an analysis of Alberta's bill, which was which which was introduced, um, but at the end of the day, the government can't fix it. You actually do need the alternatives, um, and there, I think there's real real potential for um, uh, communities to pool together. I know that there's been some discussion amongst various groups to actually use community foundations and charities that that are to provide some of the capital uh, to credit unions uh, that are needed to to do this type of stuff. So it's a partnership between those who have financial expertise with those who have both capital and connections that can actually address some of that natural community and, and capital needs of, of these folks. So uh, does that answer your question, Milton? Yeah, that's great. And uh, Brian, I just want to thank you for just taking time to, uh, to really to introduce us into that space. Some of the uh, listeners have been probably in it for some time and know it well. And for others, perhaps it's a new way of thinking about their communities evaluating resilience and whether or not these, in fact, are symptoms of other things that are not doing as well as they might and, and uh, provide an opportunity for some new strategies and solutions. So thank you for taking time to be with us today and thank you to all of our listeners. And Christy, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Milton and Brian, for sharing your insights and perspectives with us today. And thank you to all of you who are joining um, us. Your comments and questions really have helped make this dynamic and thought-provoking conversation. I really just want to extend a heartwarm thanks to you, Milton, for putting together this fabulous series. Um, there's been so much great learning and insights shared throughout the series, and we're excited to share that uh, with you all. We also would like to thank our supporters, Human Resources and Social Development Canada, um, Maytree Foundation, J.W. McConnell Family Foundation, and the Province of Ontario for making these calls possible. As promised, in a few days, we will email you uh, with links to the audio and other materials related to today's call. We also welcome your feedback on these calls, so please do email TAMRAP to let us know how we're doing. A friendly reminder uh, that this session and all the other sessions are posted on our online uh, library at www.deepeningcommunity.ca. And this website also includes relevant resources and fresh content from our thought leaders and our learning community. We also, as I'm flipping through the slides here, you'll see have a number of other exciting webinars coming up this month and next. Um, and we also have some single day events 
And we also have our um, Community Change Institute coming uh, in September in Toronto, and we really hope that you'll join us for five days of incredible learning. So we also encourage you to check out our website, uh, tamarackcommunity.ca, to learn more about these events and to sign up for a monthly e-magazine Engage. So thanks again so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Milton and Brian. Have a great day. It was a great pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody.